because of the consistency of spot and the consistency of your suppliers, there was an environment and it was, um, it was just an environment that was created by the consistency that we were seeing in, in all factors of the coffee supply chain that allowed us to become complacent as green coffee buyers and as coffee roasters. So this complacency happened because there wasn't a ramification or a risk mm -hmm. if we didn't do these things. If we didn't follow these practices, if we didn't set strict budgets, if we didn't, you know, forecast further, far enough ahead, the ramifications weren't extreme mm -hmm. where they are right. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode two of a five-part series with Caleb from Green Square. In this series, we're talking about the new normal for coffee roasters when it comes to purchasing green coffee, and it clearly is uh, the time where a new normal is emerging. And Caleb, in this episode, we're going to be talking about how has planning your green coffee offerings changed so we started touching on spot coffee in the last episode, but talk on a more broad basis. How has purchasing green coffee changed? Um, yeah, so obviously we, we mentioned spot and like the availability of oh, additional stock in, in bitumen countries is, is reducing, particularly uh, for us here in Australia. We're also seeing the uh, volatility of uh, like supply chain kind of shipping lines and shipping routes and access to product getting to you on time, no matter where you are in the world. It, it's just the highlight on this, as well as the highlight, I would say behavior from buyers at the moment is with the market being quite uh, expensive. We're seeing a lot of buyers kind of waiting the market or trying to play the market, as I hear it said, um, and, and waiting to purchase, hoping that they're going to get something lower or hoping that something's going to change. And this is just kind of heightening and highlighting pressure that's happening to get coffee when you need it. Um, for us here in Australia, particularly roasters are having to realize where they're purchasing and the actual harvest time, arrival times, planning times a lot more, where traditionally that wasn't as major a focus, um, uh, with, you know, sea freight being very consistent previously with pricing being very consistent and with availability being very consistent. So it's really understanding what's harvest when, when can I get it here? And can I cover till the next time that gets here? So yeah, a lot of roasters weren't booking for full harvest periods and covering themselves full harvest periods uh, in Australia particularly. And that is, that's almost a non-negotiable now that you need to ensure you're communicating with your suppliers, your importers to cover full harvest periods and know what that is. And then also get, get the extra that, you know, maybe that harvest period won't leave as quickly or mm -hmm. maybe there'll be delays in harvest or some environmental impacts that will delay it. So having that overflow already booked yourself rather than expecting the market to have the overflow for you. Do you think that it previously, because people could lean so much on the idea of spot coffee, do you think that that has completely gone away or at least for the foreseeable future? Um, I wouldn't say it's completely gone away. I think it's an extremely costly kind of uh, purchasing tool to rely on. From okay. my perspective, because of the consistency of spot and the consistency of your suppliers, there was an environment and it was, um, it was just an environment that was created by the consistency that we were seeing in, in all factors of the coffee supply chain that allowed us to become complacent as green coffee buyers and as coffee roasters. So this complacency happened because there wasn't a ramification or a risk mm -hmm. if we didn't do these things, if we didn't follow these practices, if we didn't set strict budgets, if we didn't, you know, forecast further, far enough ahead, the ramifications weren't extreme mm -hmm. where they are right. So you can still get through, but the ramifications are extreme affecting quality of product you have, affecting cost of product you know, and affecting the quantity you can get at that time as well. And I feel like historically, 
and when I say historically, I'm talking like modern history in mm. our industry. You could get away with being a little lazy from that perspective. You could get away with not understanding when the harvests happen in different countries, in different origin countries. You could get away with not understanding that Brazil hasn't had rain for 80 days so far this year. And But whereas now... There is so much volatility for so many different reasons that if you're not somebody that's learning about this stuff, you're losing a competitive edge. Well, it's not even really a competitive edge. It's just being able to survive the next few years with all the volatility that exists. Do you agree? Is that is that kind of the way that you yeah, look at things? I, I definitely see it the same. I see um, it was... It just it wasn't required up until now. Yeah, that's so a great way now, to put it. it wasn't required. <clears throat> I, I I as a coffee buyer in 2018 didn't gain that much from knowing Brazil's harvest cycles because right. it didn't change my bottom line. It didn't. And 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 I think this is something that's important about the planning part is I believe it's okay for a roaster to have a hard bottom line and to have a price point. And yeah. and that's a really good thing for them to have. And I think sometimes roasters would feel concerned to say, oh, this is my price. This is what I need. And I think the big challenge now is the tools or the the pricing models and and costing models they were using were for a market that was much lower and they haven't been able to actively adapt and create new processes and models to be able to handle a higher market. And how do they, how do they actually survive on that, that margin or how do they, you know, purchase coffee at these prices? So it's important to, to reset those bases and really use that to to make yourself prepared. I don't know if it's a competitive advantage. It's, it's just a reality. It's a survivability um, thing, right? If you're not going to... Yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. If you're not going to get on top of understanding what's going on, you may not be agile enough to adapt to how things are changing. I mean, not just from a price, and we're going to talk about budgeting in the next episode, but sure. it's not even from a price perspective only. Like the mm. supply that's coming out of and the quality, understanding what's going on with the harvest in different origin countries now is a directly correlated to the the quality of the coffee that you can expect out of that country. I remember a few years ago, I'm a big Ethiopian natural girl myself. And for some reason, I really love like the, the Gujis. I'm a big, I've always mm. been a big fan of Guji. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there was this one year, and I was living in the States at the time, where I just couldn't for the life of me find a good Guji. But I didn't want to kind of say anything to anyone because I thought maybe it's just my palate. And then all of a sudden we find out that there's a water issue. A few months later we find out that there was a water issue in Guji and nobody was talking Mm. about it. And so everybody had gone and bought these uh, bought Gujis, expecting that it was all going to be fine. But everybody had Guji that wasn't tasting that great, and because we didn't really know how to get informed about this stuff, and I well, I'll, I certainly didn't. You know, mm. a, a lot of people didn't know how to pick up the phone and call someone and find out are there any challenges. Uh, but because they had customers who were hell-bent on buying Gujis, a lot of people were importing Gujis expecting that everyone would just buy them because they are what they are. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know that we can get away with having that level of naivety anymore when you look at what's going on in so many different countries at the moment. Yeah, I think it's a, it is just a nat- – naturally it, it is a challenge. Like as a roaster, you have to be aware of what's happening now and you have – the luxury of these amazing relationships, like you build relationships with your suppliers and you can really use them as a, as a, as a source to understand what's happening. That the challenge is when we see like the example that you mentioned there of like, uh, a, a maybe a, um, an environmental or a, um, mm. uh, an origin based challenge for a harvest and it affecting something. I can naturally straight away empathize with why maybe producers don't want that message to get out because yeah. they go, well, we don't, we don't want to lose crop because it has been traditionally a very fickle and, and commodity-esque purchasing relationship of mm. if it's not good, I'll go somewhere else. And and this is where we think that if we can build long, long-term long relationships that and we can build the, the 
the roaster's ability to commit to long-term relationships, maybe being aware that, okay, we're not going to get our, we're not going to get our blueberry raspberry notes from Goody's this year, but we could treat them differently because we know that and we could actually mm. get something else from them and then we can account for that. So by having communication and access to information will allow you to know how to use the product, not to not use a product. And that's the, I think that's the fear mentality of a commodity, like almost a commodity expectation that maybe producers, maybe suppliers are concerned that a roaster isn't going to continue to purchase that mm -hmm. because it doesn't meet them, their exact requirements. And this is like, lands in a big rabbit hole. And anyone who knows me, I've been shouting this for a long time, but I do believe that exporters and importers are crucial in the coffee supply chain because they have the ability that if a product varies from a roaster's, you know, really narrow the quality standards in a harvest, they have the ability to go, okay, this isn't right for you, Lee, but this is going to be perfect for Caleb and he can use that. So they can sustain those relationships and actually facilitate those relationships much broader than a single roaster's quality framework. So it's a challenge. It's just one of those things that you have amazing like traders, importers that you can talk to, you can understand what's going on, but don't don't jump too quickly and, and not know mm -hmm. how I could use this product to actually make it work. Because if you've been able to buy from a cooperative for five years and then they have a bad harvest, it's like you make one bad coffee and the, and the, and the yeah. customer never comes back. And it's like, oh man, I made one mistake, it channeled, I didn't realize. Like we've got to trust those relationships. We've got to build, build context to be able to, to, to know how to use products that might differ slightly and. It's happening more, so it's it's kind of more important for us to be aware of that. I think. Yeah, and especially as we have all these challenges with climate, you know, the top five producing countries are in drought at the moment. Mm. That's, it, it, I mean, that's going to have an impact on quality. It's going to have an impact on yield. It's going to have an impact on price. All of those things are interrelated. And if people are just going to continually say, yeah, but I'm not going to buy coffee unless it scores an 87, I'm not sure that, that that's a realistic approach to doing business. I think that – and because we haven't put the effort in en masse to helping the, the consumer understand how all of this works, I think we're going to have mm. to pay the bill for cutting corners on that perspective if we haven't put in the effort to do that. You know what I mean? It's – it's you look at someone like George Howell um, – and he has spent since the 70s educating his customers by bringing them into cupping sessions and teaching them about um, like literally projectors on the wall, teaching them about what natural coffees are, what wash coffees are, doing all that kind of thing. It was really sweet. One of his customers uh, from back then commented on the YouTube videos how proud he was that he was in those cupping sessions that were put on for the public and because of that he understands why it's important for him to spend money on good coffee mm. so yeah that think... effort will will reap rewards that effort as price volatility continues to present not just price volatility but cup score uh, volatility mm. and cup quality is being put under pressure because of things that are out of producers' hands, a company like George Howe Coffee is going to reap the benefits of having been consistent in their buying philosophy, in their selling philosophy, and in the way that they communicate with customers. And I think that there are people out there that might be listening to this thinking, but we just couldn't afford the effort. Like, it's so hard to get everything done. What do yeah. you think? Like, do you have some advice for people who are trying to get on that journey now? Yeah, it is hard. Like, um, it, it is a challenging thing to be able to have that communication or value propositions. I think it's an opportunity for us um, uh, in consuming countries and as coffee roasters who are buying from all mm. around the world, no matter where you are, is it's an opportunity to, to be able to take a, a level of accountability about our purchasing. And actually have intent in our purchasing and our forecasting and our relationships and, and focus on the longevity of those relationships. Because if you can create strong relationships with your importers, with your producers, with however you purchase in the supply chain, and you can actually communicate that to your customer base, there is a 
connectivity that builds over time of, okay, we've got this coffee again this year, but now we're finding this or we've used it for this or we've treated it a different way. So actually taking our position in the industry and in the supply chain as a additive to a product, we have to add value to it. We can't yeah, skim man. the market to go find the best product and go, we're only selling that. This is in these types of market, this is where the people who are providing the most value, and that's not value from the cheapest coffee, the most value will actually be the ones to survive and the ones to thrive coming out of it. So find that, that way to add value. And that value could be from, okay, I've got this coffee and I'm in now, I was, it was a single origin last year, but now I'm actually going to use it in a, in a seasonal blend or how can I adapt with this product and use my skill set to maintain this relationship with this supplier that I love to be able to get through and make this coffee work. Um, and if you have open conversations with your suppliers of like, Hey, this one isn't cupping where it was last year. I'm thinking I might have to do this. What else do you have that we could use to do this? Then they're, they're all there for that. They mm. live and breathe to serve you guys amazing coffee and find the right copies for you. So it's just communications to find how you can use those products at values. My really, mind, really well things. put. You know, it's kind of why we're different amongst other commodities, right? You never see like a, there's no such thing as a broccoli expo. I always pick on broccoli and I'm sorry to broccoli, <laughs> but but there's no broccoli expo, right? There's no there's world like a of Mappet broccoli. There's a Mappet forward version of broccoli in a different world. In right a different now, dimension, a different 100%. It's just losing its mind that it's being absolutely <laughs> slated. But I... <laughs> I'll go do some mushrooms and go find her. <laughs> but there is no like expo for broccoli. There's no world of broccoli you know like the the conventions or or anything like that the reason there is expos for coffee industry stuff and world of coffee and all those kinds of things is because we have the there is a special relationship that happens with coffee growers between the consuming and we have a lot of work to do to make the produce a front and center of those conventions and not the equipment manufacturers. And we need to have way more conversations about how important the, the coffee producer is in this whole landscape. But what we do in this industry is different from how other people talk about the commodity that they're selling. And we just got to get better at it. And, it, and it, it'll only take time. Like if I look at myself, what, 10 years ago when I first started buying green coffee, it was like, oh, a different was world. very, very superficial as well. Yeah. Like I was buying coffee to look for that. I was roasting coffee to make myself excited. And I wasn't one thinking of my consumer, which was the first thing. Cause then I realized oh, I've got to make money yeah. out of this. So how do I get a, more consumers to like it? And then the other side of it was well, hang on, who am I buying this from? And then actually looking back into my supply chain. So I think the volatility is giving us as an industry, us as green coffee buyers and roasters, the opportunity to go, okay, things are changing. Let's look, let's put everything on the table and say, how can we actually reset and, and kind of plan yeah. and manage these relationships better? So it is it is challenging, but it's an opportunity for people who want to be active and actually want to want to continue in this space and want the, the industry continue to to kind of find ways to do that. It's really exciting to watch uh, people like you set that example and encourage other people to shift in the way that this profession is moving. I think that a lot of the people who founded this industry would be happy to see that it is transitioning to this new era of buying green coffee and being conscious and intentional about participating in the supply chain. I think we've been trying to get people to be that intentional for a very long time. The volatility that exists now isn't giving anybody any leeway about whether they can, you know, oh, am I going to participate in this way or not? It's either shit or get off the pot, right? You're either mm -hmm. going to start to uh, be intentional about the way that you bring, buy green coffee or you're going to get left in the dust because there's no room to move anymore. Which leads us to a very exciting next episode, which is all about budgeting, which is what everybody wants to know about. <laughs> how do I how do I budget for my green coffee purchases? Because shit is absolutely getting real on the sea market. And this is where you have come to shine, sir. So join us in the next episode, folks. Peace of and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, 
sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon. And stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.